God's got something for you today. Okay, and if you're anything like me, sometimes you just miss it. He's got something specifically for you. And I don't even know which you it is, but he's got something. Are you ready? Okay. We are at a tipping point in our series that we call The Life and Letters of Peter. So throughout this series so far, we have been journeying through Peter's life. We've been talking about uh, some of his foolishness, some of his amazing moments. But what I hope you found, if you've been able to journey with us for the last few weeks, what I hope you found is a little bit of yourself. Because if you're anything like me, uh, sometimes I look at Peter and I go, you know, I think I probably would have done the same thing. I probably would have made the same choice. Uh, Because Peter's stubborn. But this series is called The Life and Letters of Peter. Peter didn't just live a life. Peter wrote to the church. He wrote a couple letters we call First and Second Peter. Today, we enter into the letters of Peter. Today, we'll be looking specifically at First Peter chapter 1. And I got to tell you, I think there is something really important for us in there. But before we start, I got to tell you something that I say every single week. Peter was a real person who was really changed. Sometimes when we look at scripture, we feel like these characters, although we know they were real, we almost look at them through the lens of fictional character. We look at them and we think to ourselves, well, in that story, that character did X, Y, and Z. But the truth is, is the people that we talk about in scripture are real people who would really be sitting next to you in here. Like real, real people who are really changed. Is anyone in this room a real person who's been really changed by Jesus? It's my story. We think we're one thing, and then we encounter the reality of Jesus, not just the story of Jesus, but something real happens in us, and he begins to change us. I don't know about you, but I'm not done being changed, but I am changing because of Jesus. So, in order for us to talk about his letters, we have to figure out where we are in the story. Okay? We got to figure out what's happening. So, what I did is I, I kind of made seven steps of what I'm calling Peter's journey to help you see kind of where we are as we look at the letters of Peter. So, the first is that Peter started off fishing. He was a fisherman. He had not encountered Jesus. He was fishing on the shore, and he had an encounter where Jesus said, follow me, and Peter chose to do that. So he started off fishing, and then he received a calling. And Jesus said, follow me. And Peter dropped his livelihood, dropped all of the things that supported his family, and said, okay. So he went from fishing to a calling. And then after he chose to follow him, Jesus began to teach him and to train him. And we call that process discipleship, right? And Jesus started to lean into Peter and ask him questions like, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says back to him, I didn't tell you that, God told you. Because Peter was being developed and was learning and was growing in his faith through a process called discipleship that we actually want you to be a part of in your own journey. We want you to be through uh, becoming disciples. We call them everyday disciples here. We want you to grow in your faith and understand more about him so that you can answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? And then he moved from discipleship to a period of unrest. We started to see this a little bit with uh, Jesus saying, I'm going to be crucified. And Peter's response to him was, not on my watch. I'm not going to let them kill you. And then we find Jesus in an upper room wanting to wash the feet of Peter. And Peter's like, you ain't touching my feet. Like, that's what servants do. You're, you're God. I Remember I told you, you're, you're the Messiah. You ain't touching my feet. And eventually, he acquiesces. And then we find, we find Jesus in a garden, being arrested. And we find Peter in a season of unrest, 
pulling out a sword and just waving it, trying to get people away from Jesus and eventually lopping off somebody's ear. And then we find him at a charcoal fire in the middle of the night. Somebody say, wait, aren't you one of the guys who follow Jesus? Nope, not me. Three times. The season of unrest. He's just not okay. And then eventually, Jesus meets him on a shore after his resurrection and says, do you love me? And as Pastor Mark shared with us two weeks ago, this is a turning point in the life of Peter. So, he goes from a season of unrest to a season of pastoral ministry. You want to read a little bit about the pastoral ministry of Peter? Look through Acts 1 through 12, and you can see how even after Jesus raised from the dead and went back to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, you see Peter living out what it means to be an apostle and a pastor as he cares for people. And then we have this other period called later ministry. Towards the end of his life, what was he doing? And then eventually he, his death. Those are the seven kind of, as I'm calling them, just like the steps of his journey. But here's the deal. As we look at First and Second Peter, we're actually at a place where we're looking at the end of his ministry. The later years, okay? The later years of Peter's life. How late? Well, uh, when Peter's following Jesus, he's in his early to mid-30s. And as Peter is writing First and Second Peter, he's in his late 50s, early 60s. So a good 20, 25 years, maybe. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But how many in this room are between the age of 60 and 65? Okay? I mean, just think about it. I just told you I'm not going to ask you to. Oh, you did anyway. So I didn't ask you to. Um, what did you know between 60 and 65 that you would love to tell 30-year-old you? Right? I know. I was like, oh, so much. So much. What I would love to tell even just 30-year-old me at 43, what I would love to tell 30-year-old me is that if you eat pizza after midnight, you're not going to sleep. <laughs> That's just the truth. I don't sleep. I can't do it anymore. I used to be a youth pastor. I lived on pizza at 2 a.m. I'm not going to sleep. Right? But there's, there's so many lessons that, that we know now that we wish we could impart on the 30-year-old version of ourselves. So when I read First and Second Peter, in my mind, I see Peter sitting at a desk and he's writing or he's having, I think at some point, Silas or Sylvanus write for him. And he's thinking, and, I'm, and in my mind, what he's thinking is, okay, I was kind of an idiot when I was like 30-ish. What do I know about Jesus now that I want to tell me back then? And that question is the whole reason why I wanted to do a summer series on Peter. Because I was reading through 1 Peter and I started to think to myself, there is so much he knows now as he's writing this that he didn't know then. And now he gets to tell himself. And he gets to tell the early church, new followers who are probably making similar mistakes to the mistakes he made. And that's where we start, 1 Peter chapter 1. So as you journey with us over the next few weeks, I'd actually like you to read ahead weekly. Okay? So next week, read 1 Peter chapter 2 and so on. We're, we're just going to go chapter by chapter. And my hope is, is that by the time we finish our time together on these two letters of Peter, my hope is, is that you'll see them completely different. And then in your Bible in the future, when you go to those places, you'll go, <laughs> I remember. I remember what, what we talked about. So today is 1 Peter chapter 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to move and skim through it and pull out some things that I think are important for the conversation about how Peter wants to handle the former version of himself at age 30. Are you ready to jump into Scripture? Okay, so, uh, there's like three of you. That's great. You guys ready? All right, here we go. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Remember, any time that we write letters uh, in the Near East in the first century, they tell you who they are at the front of the letter, not at the back. Right? So they don't say sincerely, Peter. It's Peter, 
the apostle. Okay, so we're starting at the beginning of the letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To God's elect, exiles who are scattered throughout the provinces of, of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. I start letters with dear. All right, here's, here's what, what Peter's doing on the front end. Here's who I'm writing to. This is who the letter is specifically for. And y'all, Jesus is with you. And when you said yes to him, you became part of the family. And you were elected by him into that family. And now there's a word for you because we're all connected. Even though we're scattered, even though it's still not legal to be a Christian in first century Roman, Greco-Roman empire, even though it's not okay, we are all together in this even though we are scattered. As Peter is writing this letter, Peter is hanging out in the city of Rome, okay? He spent his last 15 to 20 years living in Rome, the epicenter of the Greco-Roman empire. But he's not writing to Rome, he's writing to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which are just strange words without a map. So here's a map, okay? So uh, if you're listening to this do you have a map? No? Did the map not make it? Oh, there it is. Thank you. So, uh, if you're listening to this on a podcast right now, you're going to be very confused because this is visual. Okay, so go check out the video. Um, but basically what we've got is we've got Peter over here living in Rome. Okay? Uh, on my right, your left. And, and he's over here. He's in the epicenter. But he wants to write to these places over here. Notice Asia is not a whole continent at this point. Asia is a place. It's a place that is uh, basically also called Turkey, okay? So Asia, Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Pontus. He's writing to a group of people who are living in a Gentile land, meaning it's not Jewish. He's writing to them to encourage them because guess what? It's not very encouraging to be a Christian in a Gentile place that thinks you're ridiculous, Okay? So Peter is using his wisdom to write to these places, hoping that maybe he can help encourage them so that they understand a little bit more about what it means to follow Jesus. So this is where the letter is going. This is where we find ourselves. Now, let's get in here. Verse, uh, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Everybody say new birth. Into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. All right. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Oh, man, y'all. That is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read it again, and you're all going to act like, like, like that was powerful. Okay, because this is an important place. If we miss this verse, the whole sermon's ruined. All right, here we go. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Everybody say new birth. New birth. Into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Amen. That is the money verse. Okay? This is the one that the rest of this chapter is completely built on. It'll never spoil or fade. But the word that sticks out to me is the word hope. I say that word a lot. Don't you? Maybe you don't think about it. But you say it a lot. Like, like maybe you said, I hope I don't run out of gas. Right? Or maybe I hope we go to Culver's after church. Right? Or maybe it's, I hope I get this job. Or maybe there's a teen boy sitting next to a teen girl in our congregation right now who's saying, I hope she likes me. <laughs> we use the word hope all the time. All the time. In fact, we misuse the word hope all the time the time. Because when we are talking about hope in Scripture and that Jesus Christ is our living hope, it's not, I hope we go to Culver's after church. 
It's different. See, we use the word hope, but what we actually mean is wishful thinking. Right? Man, I, I hope means I wish this happened. I'm, I'm really hoping this is what's going to happen. It's a wish. It's wishful thinking. And when we call this hope, when we call it hope, it gets really confusing. If I hope I have a good day at work, I hope somehow magically my bank account grows, I hope I'm able to pay all my bills, and I hope in Jesus Christ, and it all means the same thing, we got a big problem. Because the hope that's required in Jesus is nothing like wishful thinking. It's nothing like wishful thinking. If that were true, then we could change that verse to say, um, Jesus Christ in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living wish. No, no. It doesn't make any sense. Hope is different, and somehow we know that internally, but we use the word completely differently. Why is wishing a problem? Because wishing leads us to disappointment. See, when I hope my marriage works out and it doesn't, I'm disappointed because I was wishing it would. When I hoped I got that promotion and I don't, I'm disappointed because I was wishing I would get it. Wishing leads to disappointment. And I think the bigger concern for me is that when we call it hope and it's actually wishing, wishing leads to disappointment in God. Because when I wish for something to be the way I want it, and it isn't, is there a God that even hears me? When I'm wishing for something to be the way I want and it isn't, is there a God that hears me but doesn't care about me? If I'm wishing for something and it doesn't happen, maybe he hears me. Maybe he cares about me. Maybe he's just punishing me. See, when our hope is really just our wish, our view of God completely changes. He becomes a genie that doesn't listen. He's not granting my wishes. So, if hope isn't wishing, what is it? Well, let me try to explain that for you. In general, the idea of hope is the expectation, everybody say expectation. Okay, not a dream, an expectation of something good. It just is. Not, I hope, I think it might be, I wish it would, it's, it is. It's an expectation of good. So what does that look like in Christ? Hope in Christ is expecting God to do the good he said he would. And he will. When we hope in Christ, we are saying, hey, he, we're not saying here's my wish. We're saying, you said you would do it, you'll do it. And I put my hope that in the future I can trust in you. Okay, that in the future I could trust in you. But notice I said, hope in Christ and expecting God will do what he said he would. Hope in Christ is not expecting God to do what you say he should. Do you see the difference? It's not us going, God, you should really do this my way. That's wishing. He said it. He'll do it. We can put our hope in him. And expect the good that comes from that. So, back to that same verse, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Everybody say new birth. New birth. Into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance. Something that's not ours but is given to us, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Church, what I want you to hear today is that when we place our hope in Jesus, it is not in his death that we place our hope. Hear me. It's not, man, I really hope he was thinking about me when he died. It's not that. We don't place our hope in his burial. It's not, man, when... When they put him in that tomb, that meant he was really dead, and I should put my hope there. 
Mm -mm. We don't place our hope in his death, and we don't place our hope in his burial. We place our hope in his resurrection and his coming again. Why? Okay. Hope is in the future. We don't hope in the past. We hope in the future. We want something to happen. In order for that to happen, there has to be someone who walks with us in our future. There has to be someone in the present who's able to push us forward to the future and somehow is here and there at the same time. And if Jesus Christ is not alive, then all of this is pointless. My hope is not in his death. Church, I believe in Jesus not because he died on the cross for me. I believe in Jesus because he was raised from the dead. And if he was raised from the dead, then he wasn't a person. He was God. I put my hope that he is alive. And he's coming back. And that's where Peter put his hope. He said, living hope because of the resurrection. Verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So let's break this down just a little bit. On this earth we will face trials. Right? Y'all, <clears throat> there are some of you who this week have faced trials. And I've heard about them. And my heart breaks. There are many of you who face trials this week that I don't know about. And my heart breaks. Y'all, this world promises us nothing but trials. And I hate it. But here's what Jesus is saying. Not, he's not saying, and you can read it this way, so be careful. He's not saying, I put you through bad things so that you can prove your genuineness. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, bad things happen in this world. But those things prove your genuineness. Okay? Not, I put you through it. It's, these things happen, and you have a response to those things. So whether you have just lost a child or you're going through cancer or your marriage is breaking apart, whether you just got a diagnosis that makes no sense, I'm not saying that Jesus gave that to you because he didn't. But here's what I am saying. You have a choice. You have a choice to say, I knew that this world would have trials, but all of my hope is in Jesus. Or you have a choice to say, God, I hoped this wouldn't happen. Why are you doing this to me? You see how important it is to understand hope? You will face trials. They will come. And they will prove your genuineness. In fact, that word proven and that word refined are basically the same word in Greek. So we get refined just like gold gets refined. But here's the difference. When we're refined, it's forever. When gold is refined, it will, it will, it'll, it'll perish. No matter how much you look at gold and wish you had more of it, it will perish. But in the end, the work done in you will not. And because of that, it will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ, the living one, the living hope, is revealed. Trials will come. You have a choice. I have a choice. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I read that and I was like, ooh, that's not for Bithynia, that's for Tim. I felt like Paul stopped and just wrote to me and maybe you feel the same way. Re hear this from your lens, okay. Though you have not seen him. You love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in, in him. Right? And what that does, if we allow it, 
is it fills us with inexpressible and glorious joy. For we are receiving the salvation of our souls. We are no longer dying, we're living. It's beautiful. 1 Peter chapter, verse 13, it says, therefore, everybody say therefore. Listen, anytime you see the word therefore in scripture, stop reading immediately. And say, therefore what? And then go back and figure out why he says therefore. Okay? Because there's something before the therefore that he's now adding on to. Okay? So the, the before the therefore, in this case, is Jesus Christ is our living hope because he was raised from the dead. He's alive, which makes him living hope. And because of that, we get to choose to follow him even though we can't see him. And we receive the benefit of that, which is the faith and salvation of our souls. Okay? Therefore. Now that we've got that sorted out. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. Okay? That word sober is not talking about alcohol. The word sober means ready, alert, uh, clear, clear thoughts, clear mind. Okay? Now that you are alert, ready, and clear-headed, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Set your hope, which means we have a choice. We actually should make the decision to set our hope. You can choose hope. It's a choice. It's not a, uh, well, am I, am I far enough in my faith? Do I understand enough scripture? You can choose hope today. Set your hope on Jesus 14 and 15, as obedient children, everybody say children. Okay, remember, we've been born again into a new family. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Do not just accept evil in your life. Do not just go, it's fine, I'm totally okay, it's fine. And just take on evil. Do not conform to your evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And that's in Leviticus 11. I read that and I'm like, easy for you to say, Peter. But let me help you. I don't know how to be as holy as God is holy. And in fact, I fall flat on my face all the time. Church, we're supposed to strive for something that's unnatural in our flesh. We're supposed to strive to be like Christ. And Christ was holy. But to be honest with you, it's not something you just wake up one day and say, you know what, today I've decided, it's a beautiful day. Today is a great day to be holy. And then you just, what does that mean? You like skip through life like picking flowers? Or you serve all your neighbors and now you're magically holy? I know what's going on in your head because it's going on in mine too. Holiness is not a choice. Hope is a choice. Holiness is a journey. Okay? Our hope in Christ should lead us to live more like him. If we hope in him, it should lead us to live more like him. Pastor Tyler last week said it this way. If you are on a journey with Christ, you can't stay the same. If we're putting our hope in him, it'll cause us to be more like him. And as we become more like him, the process of that is just simply called holiness. As I look more like Jesus, I become more holy. It's just the way it works. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, just re remember, we've been born again, we're like obedient children, which means we have a father, okay? Since you call on a father who is God himself, who judges each of your person's work impartially, meaning he sees you all the same. He looks at you as individual creations, okay? Live out your time as foreigners. Everybody say foreigners. Here in reverent fear. We are called to live as foreigners in this world. There's a difference between a foreigner and a citizen, right? They're not the same. Otherwise, they'd all be called citizens, 
okay? There's a foreigner and there's a citizen. So what is a foreigner? A foreigner who is in a place where he doesn't look like everybody else or act like everybody else or think like everybody else because he has his own place that he's from, okay? When we say yes to God as our father, we become citizens of heaven, which makes us foreigners here. This is not our home. We don't live here. And I know that for some of you, you're like, this dude's crazy. I totally live here. Okay? I know. But, but, but follow me. When we say yes to Jesus and our home is with him, this world is no longer our home. It's not our home. So we live as foreigners in this place. So, so my question is, do we look any different? I don't know. I mean, maybe you think when you put on that Christian t-shirt, that makes you like a citizen of heaven or something. But the truth is, is on this earth, we don't look that different. And we should. Not on the outside, but the way we interact with people. The way we treat people. The way we love all persons, because all persons are made in the image of God. And that's the language of our home. Right? So, if we're supposed to look and act different, then our priorities should be different than the rest of the world. What I want to share with you this morning is that the priorities of an everyday disciple are different. We reject what the world sees as success. Yeah, you don't like that one either, do you? I didn't like that either. In fact, I wrote it out, and then I went to Pastor Mark's office, and I was like, I don't like this. And he was like, I don't like it either. But I couldn't escape it. So my entire life, my dream is to have a beautiful family, to live in a house that I'm proud of, to have cars that work properly, right? <clears throat> To go to church and love God and to make more money than I could possibly ever need. And you want to know why that was my dream? Because that's the dream embedded in me by the world that I live in. Okay. Here's what I'm not saying in this room. It is not a bad thing to be successful. Hear me. It's not a bad thing to be successful. It's not a bad thing to strive for success. It's not a bad thing to get a raise. It's not a bad thing to have a nice house or have a nice car. It's not a bad thing to have a beautiful family. It's not a bad thing to come to church. Those are not bad things. But when you are an everyday disciple, your priorities change. And only you know whether or not your priorities are in the right order. So let me help you. If you think because you came to church today, you're doing just fine, you're wrong. If you think because you brought your whole family to church and you all look real good and we don't know about the fight you had at home yesterday, you're wrong. If you think because nobody knows about your addiction, that you're safe, you're wrong. We are broken, fallen people. And we are a hot mess. That's the truth. All of us are. So the question isn't, is it okay to be successful? The question is, is it okay to have money? The question really is, what are you chasing? See, when you say yes to Jesus, and you're an everyday disciple, and you have said, I put my hope in him, you only get to chase one thing, and it's him. Everything else trickles out of that. It's not about your church attendance. It's about who you're chasing or what you're chasing. As a former drug and alcohol counselor, I sat with many people in addiction. And I got to hear what they're chasing. And at first, it sounded like drugs and alcohol that they were chasing. But can I tell you what they're really chasing? They're chasing peace. They're chasing a deep breath knowing that they're loved by someone. 
and they found it in the wrong thing. You can be on that same journey just without drugs and alcohol and be in the same spot. What are you chasing? And if the answer is nothing, chase Jesus because he's all you really got. It's not about what you have or don't have. It's about what you're chasing. That lets you know whether or not you are a foreigner of this place or just a regular old citizen. Verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things, things that die, like gold or silver. Oh, successful things. It's not with perishable, successful things like gold and silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. Ouch. It's not because, you know, when, before you were a Christian, did you know that you're living an empty way of life? That's what Peter calls it. You were not bought from these things. You were not given these things because of gold and silver from this empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Okay, so here are your options. House, job, we'll just call it gold and silver. Your options are gold and silver that will eventually perish, even though they are precious right now. Or there's a Jesus who existed before gold and silver were ever created. And at the end, when gold and silver perish... He's still there because he's alive. Those are your options. The precious commodity of gold and silver or the precious blood of the lamb who was slain for you. Bottom line, his value is greater than anything you want to fill in that blank with. His value is greater. Verse 22, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring, which means never ending work, uh, sorry, word of God. Verse 21, through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope in God. Because of what he's done, because of his value, change your priorities, change your view of success, get rid of chasing all the things in this world that will eventually die. Put your full hope and trust in Jesus because he is alive. That is 1 Peter chapter 1. So the question that I had was how do I begin to put my hope in Jesus? Notice I said begin because this is not a here's three steps and now you're fine. That's not what, what we're doing today. But we can take some small steps in that direction. Okay, I got three things. Number one, shift your focus, move from problems to purpose. Okay? Now, I spend a lot of time, maybe it's just my personality, I spend a lot of time thinking about the things I don't have. Anybody else do that? And like when they're in like a bad spot, like they're just having a rough day, it's like here's all the things I don't have and this is why my life is terrible. Okay? Then you meet someone whose life is worse, and you're like, oh, I'm not so terrible. You meet somebody whose life is better, and you're like, why am I not like them? You know, We're never satisfied, are we? But what happens is, is we can get into a pattern where our focus is completely on the problems. Where all we're thinking about is everything that's wrong in our lives. Everything that's not working the way it should. What if we moved from problems to purpose? Why am I here? Not what do I need or what don't I have, but why am I here? Let me help you. In its most basic form, you are here to love God and to love others. That's it. Love, love God. And do all the things that that means. And love others. What if every time I thought about the things that were wrong in my life, I said, okay, how am I going to love God and love others in this moment? To get my mind back on what is real, which is our purpose, and get my mind off of the problems. Simply shift your focus minute by minute if you have to. Second, change your prayers. Okay? 
Change your prayer. Spend time, spend more time honoring than you do asking. I got a call a couple months ago from a buddy of mine who I've known since we were kids. And he called me and this is what he said. Hey man, I just wanted to call you, and, and he's a believer, he loves the Lord. I just want to call you and tell you that I'm praying for you and I love you. I was like, cool. So what's up? And he's like, that, that was it? I was like, well, you, do you need something? Nope. I just wanted to say I love you and I'm praying for you. And when I hung up, I thought to myself, that's a true friend. You know? I think God wants some calls from us like that. I think God wants a call sometimes from us where we just go, hey, man, um, Thank you. That's it. I, I, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for me. We spend a whole lot of time, God, would you, would you be with my loved one? God, would you, would you heal my disease? God, would you, and those are, those are okay too. But I'll tell you, if you're doing a whole lot more asking than you are honoring, you're missing the point of prayer. When we say, hey, God, uh, I just, uh, instead of just giving you my list today, I would like to stop and just tell you, you have changed my life. It changes the relationship. And when we say amen, I think God goes, well, that was nice. It's just different. It's different. Right? The disciples looked at Jesus at one point and said, teach us how to pray. And he said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He started his prayer with honor. Change your prayers. Spend more time honoring than asking. And three, let others in. I don't blame my parents for this, but I, I saw it happen in front of me, and I think I started to model it. I got confused between the difference between personal and private. See, I think I was taught, and not, not on purpose, but I think I was taught that my relationship with Jesus was private. I mean, in my home, I knew my parents loved the Lord, and I knew they were committed to him, but we didn't talk about spiritual things at home at all because it was private. That was my relationship with Jesus. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. Church, I think that that's a work of the enemy, to be honest with you. What the enemy wants is for you to have a relationship with Jesus that you are convinced that no one can ever understand, no one will ever accept you as you are, and you should just hold it to yourself in a box. Your relationship with Jesus is not meant to be private, it's meant to be personal. You're supposed to have one, and it's between you and Jesus, but you're supposed to let others in and help them see how you see Jesus, and they help you see Jesus how they see Jesus. The whole point is to let others in. Your faith is never meant to be, per it was never meant to be private, it was meant to be personal. The way we say that here a lot is you were never meant to do this alone. You were never meant to follow Jesus by yourself. And if you're interested in figuring out how to let others in, would you let us know? Because we can help make those connections for you. So as the worship team comes up to close this out, I really just have one more thought that I want to share to make sure that you and I are on the same page as we move into 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's this. If your hope is placed in anything other than Jesus, money, Success, relationships, maybe you've put all your hope in yourself. If your hope is placed in anything but Jesus, it will die. And maybe you'll experience success. And maybe you'll experience relationships. But honestly, it's just like gold and silver. At some point, it all dies. 
So I have an option for you. Let me give you a suggestion. What if instead of placing your hope in the things that the citizens of this world place their hope in? What if you place your hope in Jesus Christ, our living hope? What if you set aside all the things that you desire and you said, the thing I'm chasing moving forward is Jesus Christ, not my hope, my living hope. What if today you cast aside the things that you've been focused on that you know are not Jesus? Even if they're good, they're not God. What if you cast those aside? And you said, I am all in on Jesus Christ, my living hope. I had a conversation with someone yesterday on the phone who's a part of our congregation. And we were talking about uh, the evil in the world and we were talking about some of the concerns that he has. And, and one of the things I said was, he, well, his comment was, how do I know that God is who he says he is? And I said, man, all I can tell you is that Jesus has changed me enough that I don't doubt him for one second. But here's the other thing. And I would strongly encourage you to just take this point of view as well and stop looking for answers to your wishful thinking. What if we just said, if we're, if we're wrong, we're okay with it? What if we just put it down and stop trying to figure it out? Stop trying to, well, I'm not really sure, and I was seeing this thing on YouTube, and it made me rethink, and I don't know which version of the Bible I should read, and I don't know, I don't know if I believe the same. What if we set all that stuff down, and we just said, Jesus Christ is our living hope. I'm putting my trust and faith in him. I'm going to call out to him with honor. I'm going to get my priorities right and chase him. And if I'm wrong, I guess I'm good going down with the ship. That's where I'm at, folks. I'll be honest with you. If I find out at the end of my life that I missed it, and all this time I should have been living a completely different way, I'm totally okay with that. I am all in on Jesus. And from a place of putting my hope in him, I begin to understand him deeper. And then my questions start to get answered. So if you're just hanging out, like doing the hokey pokey, you got one foot into faith and then you take your one foot back out, right? Um, at some point, you just got to make a decision. Either he is the most valuable, beautiful thing in the world who was there before creation even occurred and is still alive today. Either that's who he is. Or the other option is, if I could just get enough money, I could just get enough good relationships, if I could just feel good enough, then my life would be perfect. It's either Jesus or it's you.